Hello everyone, Mark Sabatella here from Mastering MuseScore. I'd like to welcome you to the MuseScore Cafe. So this is my regular weekly series where I talk about some aspect of making music using MuseScore, show you how to do different things, and uh, you know explore different aspects of a particular topic. And um, it's brought to you by the Mastering MuseScore School. And if I had uh, been smart, I would have already posted the link and pinned it to the top, but I forgot to. So I'm going to do that right now. But uh, by all means, I encourage you to check out my site here, um, which you're going to see in a moment. School.masteringmusecore.com. And I will pin it to the top of the chat. My uh, complete online course that's there has like really pretty much everything there is to know about using MuseScore, as well as I've got courses on music theory and composition and counter. End of commercial, we usually pick a topic and talk about that. And this is the third Wednesday of the month, and I've been doing a page of the month. And uh, people have been enjoying this series. I could still use more suggestions for particular pages of music to uh, enter. So by all means, uh, you know, you don't have to wait for me to be calling. Just uh, um, drop drop me comments anytime you want about uh, pieces that you'd like me to pick. But one of the pieces that uh, got mentioned last time, and by the way, Sora, I saw your comment this morning, and that's sort of a different sort of thing, the idea of how you might combine pieces I might talk about that in a in a different episode, but for the page of the month, I really just want to focus on entering one page of music and keep it keep it with that theme. Um, but the short answer is I don't really have a good answer for you. <laughs> if you want to combine two pieces of music, uh, either use a PDF editor or just copy and paste in MuseScore. That's basically your your options, unfortunately. So um, uh, one of the things that had been discussed. Uh, I don't know, a few months ago when when uh, when I did one of these sessions and people were talking, uh, the idea of doing an opera score page uh, came up. And I had specifically mentioned that I was a little fascinated by the fact that in Falstaff, there is a fugue um, and that I, uh, you know, I had been just working on my counterpoint course and figured a, uh, um, uh, a um, the entering the fugue from the Falstaff opera um, by Verdi would be uh, an interesting little, you know, challenge. So that's what I've pulled up here, except the thing is, I don't remember where the actual fugue part starts. I mean, I'm looking at the score here, and I definitely see some call and response kinds of things here. I, I remembered it. It was towards the end of Act 3. Um, and if anyone knows exactly where it happens, but I think it's right after this passage with those, uh, um, I think it's actually right after these ascending passages here. Um, this is not it there still. Um, and so I'm just going to pick a random page if I can't find the actual fugue per se. Um, oh, maybe this is it here. Uh, is this? Eh, or not. Um, so, um, Yeah, I uh, I thought I, I knew where it was, and apparently I am just mistaken. But I am just going to pick a page from this uh, to enter, a page from Falstaff. And uh, I guess what I'm going to do, this all looks like, I want, I want a page with, uh, you know, multiple things going on uh, in terms of the... Uh, um, instrumentation and so forth. So I'm going to keep scrolling down and who knows, maybe I will run into the actual fugue because I think I'll recognize it when I see it. Um, yeah, this is all kind of recitative, recitative looking stuff, but, uh, let's look at this little passage right here, um, on page 123. So, First of all, the thing is, you can tell here that 
it's different. Uh, it, it's reduced instrumentation here. There's only flute, whatever. Oh, that's one of the characters. That's another character. This is the chorus and some strings. And that's basically all that's happening here. Although on other pages, it's a full score, right? So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to set up my score um, by going to flipping over to Muse score, and I'm going to actually enter. I'm going to call it Falstaff, and I'll call it Act Three. Verdi, um, Giuseppe. Yeah, I know how to spell Giuseppe. Um, it's G U I Giuseppe. Verdi, I think. Um, in any case, um, you know, you 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 put in the information that you want in that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the, uh, mm, I guess I'm going to pick the classical orchestra. It's a smaller orchestra than the one that says symphony orchestra, and that's fine. I, you can add instruments, remove instruments, and so forth. Um, so, uh, so sorry, if you could tell me what page or what rehearsal number or what measure number that starts would be the uh, would be the real uh, the 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 good thing to have happen. So I'm going to not bother entering a key signature here because it, it changes key multiple times, and I I, I seldom bother entering keys, um, and because I know I can deal with that later. So I've got my full score here, but I need vocal scores, also, uh, vocal staves also. So I'm going to enter a few. I'm going to enter uh, a couple of voice staves, and then I'm going to enter a choir. And I'm going to take a look at the PDF and see how oops, the choir is... Um, I was just looking at a choir part. And it was notated as such, soprano, yeah, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. So I'm just going to enter those four parts. I'm going to enter a soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. And so one thing already is, as of version 3.6 in MuseScore, it knows proper score order. In other words, it knows where to put those voices. It knows to put them after the percussion, but before the strings because that's where they go in orchestral scores so i didn't have to do anything special to make that happen um which is nice um but you know you can always use the arrow buttons to move things around here or if you didn't want it in orchestral order you wanted it in choral order where the chorus would actually be on top and then all accompaniment below or you know different different types of ordering you can select from the different types of ordering in here but i'm going with the orchestral ordering because i know that's what fit this piece and the thing is also instantly you see that it doesn't all fit on the paper um, because MuseCore doesn't try to automatically size things to fit a page. And it always comes up as something that people would like to see. And yes, we would all like to see that happen. The complication is, well, what does that really mean? Do you, do you change it per page? Because not all pages are going to be the same size in terms of how many staves are there. So we could pick a staff size for you that allows the first system to fit on the first page. But then that's probably too small for the rest of your of your score where you're not using all of those staves and therefore you didn't need the print to be that small. And so it's um uh um it's it's a little it's just tricky to figure figure that out. So I'm just gonna have to do this um by kind of eyeballing things. Uh and what I'm going to do is I am going to enter some notes for whatever page. So I see you say it's closing the, the opera. And so I'm going to guess it's still further down than I'm looking. I'm looking at page 120 something. And uh, uh, this is... Sorry, could you say that again? Really? Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. That's interesting. Siri decided to talk to me. Um, so... Uh, Anyhow, uh, yeah, Siri was trying to talk to me for no good reason. And um, it's definitely towards the end. I know that. But um, 
I'm down to the last 20 pages and I'm not convinced. Oh, is this it? Da, 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 that actually looks quite promising. So I'm going to call this it. Whether this is literally it or not, because I remembered it being in the rehearsal letter 50 something range. So, um, Yeah, I'm just going to start with this page right here. Um, and so uh, the things that I can see is that, yeah, it's not using all the instruments, but it's using different instruments on the first system versus the second system, and that's great. Um, uh, so, yeah, it would be nice to just know it's not going to fit. So the first thing I always do after creating a big score is just look at the bottom and see, does it fit? But the thing is... Um, Oh, by the way, <laughs> uh, I don't know if you just noticed the lights flicker, but uh, we are having a crazy windstorm today. We were warned about it last night, and the winds are picking up. We're expecting hurricane force winds today. And if that means I lose power, <laughs> it means I lose power. So I uh, apologize in advance if uh, if that happens. Okay, so... Um, uh, in any case, I don't even want to mess with the the size of my staves right now because um, I'm never I'm never going to have a whole system on one page necessarily. But I guess I'll do it just for the sake of argument. I'm going to go to Format Page Settings and I'm going to be looking at my page preview here and just reduce this until it fits. And that one notch did it already, and I'm just going to call that good. So it fit a system on this page, and that's good enough for now. So now I want to come back, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to size my window in a way. I've mentioned when I do these page things before that um, I typically, if I'm entering music from a PDF, I'll have the PDF open in a separate window normally rather than try to... Um, do what you know flip back and forth between windows i mean not, not a separate window a separate display i'll have a a, a separate laptop set up with a, a display um in that i can copy from but you know i don't have that luxury right now so i'm not going to worry about it um i have i mean i have another laptop but you wouldn't be able to see the screen so um uh what i've got here then is uh, Muse score, you know, on the top here and my PDF on the bottom in a way that I can see it. And yeah, I can probably expand this bottom screen better to uh, fit. Yeah. It's temperamental as far as holding on to my uh, Zoom setting. So that's not necessarily always a good thing. Um, okay, so what I want to do is I want to see which instruments I actually need and start entering something into them right away. And then I'm going to turn on hide empty staves. Um, I think I want to do that so I don't have to deal with the whole score right now. So I'm going to assume that, first of all, I'm just going to enter a page break somewhere. Why? Because by doing that, I know that this this is not going to move. The start of this page isn't going to move. And then I can add more measures in front if I want. Because I'm adding a page in the middle of the score, I don't want this to look like it's the beginning of my score. Um, but I don't want it to accidentally shift to the previous page because some further layout page, some other layout changes. So I kind of locked this measure in as uh, what, what I want it to be by putting in that uh, page break before it. So what I want here is an oboe staff, and I think I was better off just leaving that because it's just temp being temperamental as far as uh, the the not wanting to withhold not 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 wanting to stay a zoom setting. Actually, let me just see if I increase it this way if that helps. Yeah, maybe this will actually work better. Instead of using, I was using my touchpad, but I think it might hold better. So what I see here is I need, in the second measure there, oboes. And uh, key signature-wise, let's let's see that. Do I have the right key signature? Do I have the right time signature? Well, key signature-wise, I see no key signature, so that's good. But I have no idea what time signature this is. Um, I see one, two, three, four beats of four, four. So maybe I'm in four, four. Oh, it's in common time. So that's basically four, four. 
but just to make sure it actually, you know, I, I see the same thing. I'm going to change this from 4-4 uh, four, four to common time, which of course is the same thing, just a different way of displaying it. So I'm in common time and I can now enter my stuff here in the second measure of the oboe part. I have uh, a quarter rest, so I'm going to be using sh keyboard shortcuts all over the place here. Um, uh, zero. So out my uh, display of keystrokes has moved with the window, and um, I think that still works for you. Let me know if it doesn't work, but I, I think that actually will continue to work uh, decently well here. So now I'm going to use uh, four for the eighth note, and then I'm going to enter these chords bottom to top. A, F, and then I see it's staccato, so shift S, and then a rest, zero, and then C, E, rest. Oops, let me undo the rest. Shift S for staccato, zero, and then G, B, and it's shift B. Um, and then uh, the next measure, so I'll just move over to the measure there, is G, C. And that's basically it for the page. I mean, as far as, you know, how many measures fit on this system. But there's, um, there's actually going to be two systems on this page, right? So I'm going to put a system break there. And so a second system will fit on the page once I turn on hide empty saves. Um, so uh, I added two voices. Um, so. Uh, Yes, I added two voices in deliberately because they are, when the page I was looking at had two solo voices as well as the choir. Um, what I don't know here is, I don't know the characters here. So this is one of the characters. Um, this is one of the characters that's part of the choir. I, I actually don't know what um, what all these voices are meant to represent. So, um, but what I can tell you is there are one, two, three, four, five, six vocal staves. And I have six vocal staves. So I think I got what I need by, uh, you know, uh, kind of luck here. Um, so I've got my uh, oboe staff. And next I need a clarinet staff. Now it says clarin clarinet in do, which is basically C. For those of you who don't know, in uh, Italian, Spanish, French, and maybe Russian, they, uh, uh, some countries use do as the name for C, as opposed to how English speakers usually think of do in terms of, oh, it's whatever the tonic of your key is in a lot of countries. No, do is just the name for C. So this is telling me that these clarinets are not B flat clarinets like we're used to, they are C clarinets. So I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna right click that thing and go to staff properties and say, no, I don't want clarinets in B flat. I want to change to clarinets in C, which aren't an option here, but I'm pretty sure that exists. So I'm going to search for clarinet. And sure enough, here's clarinet in C. And then I can even change it to say clarinet in Do and change the short name to be Claire. in do although was that clarinet or is that cornet yeah it's clarinet in do so clarinet in do um is now the thing and i'll change the part name to to that also so now i've got that part name set uh better and the transposition is now what it should be namely no transposition so uh i can now enter the same uh content into this and it's the same rhythm as the oboe, and if it was much more complicated, I would probably use copy and paste and repitch mode to deal with it. But boy, that's I I feel like for me the trade off just isn't there. I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna find it easier to just re-enter this thing. So D D Shift A staccato, and then rest, and then G. Oh, now look at this. This is interesting. Um, the G is um, 
got two stems on it because it's using multiple voices. Now this is a this is a thing. It's a thing that exists in the world that maybe um, <laughs> uh, I might have not have chosen to do it this way. But he's got the two clarinets in the same voice where they can be, and he's splitting into two voices only for that one note. Why? Not because the rhythms are different, but to emphasize that there are in fact two clarinets playing that G. So this is kind of a curious little notation there that I'm going to have to deal with. And so what I'm going to do is I'll enter the G and the staccato dot and then move on and then enter the other chord as G down here and F and the staccato dot. But now um, I am going to have to enter voice two. And voice two is only going to have that one note in it. So I'm going to come back to that measure, go back to note input mode. I, I, I didn't have to leave note input mode. I just sort of did. Um, and so I'm going to enter uh, basically a half rest. Oops. Uh, voice two with control alt two, six for my half rest, zero. And then I'm immediately press V to hide it. And now I'll enter my eighth note for G. And there is not a second staccato dot on it. If I type shift S right now, it's gonna put a second staccato dot there. For playback purposes, I probably want that. So I'm, I guess I'm gonna go with it and then I'll mark it invisible when I'm done. Um, and then, uh, the, the other two rests are there automatically, so I'm going to mark those two rests invisible. V, V, and select the staccato dot. Make it invisible. So now that measure is the way it should be. There's also dynamics, so I might as well get my dynamics in there. And I'm going um, kind of haphazardly as far as the order that I'm doing things in, and frankly, that's typical for me. I'm not... Uh, I'm not always thinking as far ahead and saying, oh, first I'm going to enter my notes, then my articulations, then my art, then my dynamics, or, you know, I, 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 I'm much more of a seat of the pants kind of guy. So, um, I'm, uh, just checking to see if I have any, um, uh, Track down comment. Oh, yeah. So the uh, if if I change, so when I was in the instruments dialogue, yes, if I change from common to all, that does the trick, but I usually just use the search box um, because to me that's easier to search for clarinet than to switch to all and then hunt for it. The search does a, a nice job of it. So that's how I usually do things, but the author certainly works as well. And then uh, in this measure, I need uh, eighth note, C and E and staccato also. So uh, next we have the uh, uh, bassoon here, F-A-G, Fagate. Um, his uh, bassoons, and it's uh, just one bassoon here playing. Um, that's what the capital one indicates, and that's fine. I'll enter that as text, but I'm going to have to skip to where the bassoon part is, and here's the bassoon part, luckily, right below, and it starts right off on that first measure, so it's a quarter rest, and then an eighth rest. Oh, not an eighth rest, so this is a little so I kind of missed this. This is a triplet, right? So it starts off with, it's a triplet starting with an eighth rest. So I don't want to enter that. I need to select the full length of the triplet, which is the quarter note, and then control three. And that enters my uh, um, triplet. So now I can enter the rest and then the E. Oh, not an E. Sorry, I'm still thinking treble clef. It's a G. Now it's a G, A, B flat, I hit the down arrow for that, G, E, 5, D. And the D has an accent, that shift V, and oh, I messed up because I didn't realize it was another triplet also. Um, so I'm just going to undo all that, and 5, control 3. And yes, some sometimes it would be nice if triplets kind of stayed engaged, but they don't, and that's just the way it is. By the way, there is a shortcut now to enter that B flat um, <clears throat> uh, before you enter the thing, but I never I defined it, and I still cannot for the life of me remember what it is, but I'm going to try. Shift, control, bracket. 
Ah, I got it. Shift control left bracket because I defined that myself. It's it's available to find as a shortcut. So now the the flat sign is is there selected on the toolbar, so I can enter the B and it automatically becomes B flat. G E then my D and uh, accent it, and then eighth note. So sim. So I don't use these shortcuts. I use the arrow keys, but um, uh, my my shortcut there, control shift right bracket, and then for C, we'll enter that eighth note. So then, because I guess I'm doing one staff at a time, doing everything with it, I guess I'll enter that slur now. So I've already got the C sharp selected, shift to the G, and then S to enter the slur. Now, notice that the original is not showing the bracket. That's how I missed the triplet, because really that there should have been a bracket there. Um, so that's not really cool. But if you want to if you want to emulate that, let me close my play panel. Um, uh, I can select under bracket type none, and now I get just the three. Furthermore, I can flip. I can select the three and press X to flip it up, and select the other X and press three to flip it up. Um, so that totally does the job. Um, so what else do I need? I need the crescendo there. So it extends from the G to uh, through the B flat. So I select that and press the shortcut, the less than sign for crescendo. Now I've got my crescendo. And the one text there is basically sitting on the rest. So I'll do that. I will enter that as control T for staff text one, you know, Roman numeral one period. And that's that. So realistically, um, uh, right now, MuseScore does not do a good job of the automatic placement of, of results. This is one of the few collisions that we don't detect and fix properly, are collisions between tuplet numbers and slurs. Uh, fingerings might also um, present a problem, fingers and slurs, I can't remember. But as it is, um, what I might choose to do is uh, this, this, first of all, this is not terrible as is, and I might prefer to just see that slur. I'll use the arrow keys to push it up a little bit. Oops. Um, so I think I'm doing that, but automatic placement is like doing its own thing also. So sometimes when I'm adjusting slurs for complicated situations, I will press equals to turn off automatic placement for the slur. Um, and because otherwise there's all sorts of automatic things that help reshape the slur as you adjust it. And sometimes it just gets in your way. Now he has the, the slur ending below the three and then extending above the other three. Yeah, I could try to do that also. So I could select this guy and move it down and then select the midpoint and move it up. And that kind of does the trick. You know, I can fiddle with these things a little bit more, but I like to keep things simple. I like to just end, I just use the endpoints and the middle point, and I adjust things using control up and down, which goes a full staff space at a, at a time. In fact, you can see that really clearly. See how the, the slur is touching that bottom line? Control up. Well, um, it's it's more complicated for curves, I guess. Um, but for most, for, for most um, symbols, uh, control up, control down, control left, control right, move one staff space at a time. But for curves like um, slurs, it uh, um, it affects this whole complicated mathematical calculation. So anyhow, I've got my oboe, my uh, bassoon part in there. And so next I need core. And so now here's the next thing about uh, knowing what's going on here. Uh, I, I've heard this debated and wish I knew the answer. These are either trumpets or they're horns. So the thing is, some people would look at that core and say, hey, that's cornet. And some people would look at it and say, no, no, it's corno, it's horn. And apparently different translations or different languages work out differently. So in point of fact, I don't know the answer until I look at the pitches. And I see that this G below middle C seems an unlikely choice for um, an actual uh, cornet. Um, plus, I don't think that would have been a commonly used instrument for this. So I'm gonna guess that that really is a horn. So I'm gonna go ahead and change my horn 
to um, horn in C. So again, staff properties, change instruments, uh, brass, and it only has horn and F there. So I'll use the uh, search to find horn. And there's tons of horns here, but there we go. Horn and C. And there's horn and C alto. And is there also horn and C? And I'll be danged if that, I don't know if that's bass alto clef or if it's just a difference in range, but I'm just going to call it horn and C. So I'm not even going to bother with the naming on this stuff for now. So I've got my C horns here, and there's actually only one staff of it, but see how there's a curly brace there? That curly brace is telling me that in some parts of the score, there must literally be two uh, horn parts. Uh, so, and actually, the way horns work, by the way, is usually there's four horns, and first and third, uh, first and third get grouped together and second and fourth get grouped together for reasons that uh, historical reasons that don't necessarily make a ton of sense, but that that's the way it is. So it's good that I have two staves here for the horns, even though we're only going to use one, but he's got a curly brace here. The modern standard is to use a square brace. Well, I am just going to go ahead and change it. So I'm going to delete that. I'm going to select that square brace, delete it, select the two staves, open my braces, my brackets palette, uh, and use the curly brace to connect those two. So now my horns are connected with a curly brace. All right, I haven't saved this thing yet, so I got to do that. So I'm going to do this, and so I got my scores folder, which I guess is where it defaulted today. Oh, for new scores? I... I I haven't saved anything to this folder for a while, so I'm not sure why it defaulted there. Usually it defaults to whatever, where I've saved things most recently. But in any case, I will go to my Mastery Muse score, Cafe 2021, and that's where I'm going to save this thing. Did I really double click that and my system's just being that slow, or did I fail to double click it? I think I failed to double click it. There we go. Okay, so I now have in my uh, horn part. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I don't have the horn part. I just have the, uh, um, the the horn part set up. So all I need to do is enter into that second measure there of the horn part. I'll shrink this down a little bit. In fact, I'll just hit um, uh, my shortcut Control Slash is for. Uh, page width, and that makes uh, it sizes the score to fit the width of the page. I'm not going to be using the inspector much, so I'm just going to close it right now. So I, so that, and that automatic, when I do that, notice the score automatically got wider. That's a nice thing about that page width. It sort of adapts. If I also close the palette with, um, by pressing F9, now it gets wider still. So that's sort of a, a neat little trick you might find useful sometimes. All right, so starting in that measure, I want a quarter rest and uh, then eighth note D. And I don't see a staccato dot on it unless that little thing there is like a little staccato dot. But there's staccato dots on the other notes and the other parts had it. So I'm going to assume it was, me it was meant. Mm -hmm. So move it down an octave, add the staccato dot, and then rest. G staccato rest G down an octave with control down staccato dot zero and then C staccato dot. Now he's got the staccato dots above the notes. So here you get to make your own decision. Like I've made some effort to copy some of the, ori the original editor's idiosyncrasies. I'm not going to copy this one. I'm not a fan. The staccato dots belong on the note head side, and modern musicians are used are used to seeing them there. And it's entirely possible that a musician would completely miss these staccato dots because they're on the wrong side of the note. So um, I'm not going to fix it. I'm not going to make it look exactly like his. But if you wanted to, by all means, click the staccato dot, press X, that flips it up. But I'm I'm not going to do that. So I I'm I'm not going to be a stickler for copying every idiosyncrasy of the original. I'm going to be faithful to it, but but also try to modernize it a little bit. That's my call. 
So um, I now get to the vocal staves, yay. So the vocal staves, I scroll down to where the first vocal part is. And what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna look and see. So there's a Q, a Fen, a Fall, and those are the three vocal staves here. But on the next system, it's A, Q, Fen, and Fall. So Q can't be my top staff. And I don't know how eventually if, who all these parts are gonna represent here. Because um, if this is a fugue, I'm expecting maybe yeah more parts enter. Um, so I'm just going to pick A to be my top voice and Q to be my second voice. And uh, so Q here is my second of my vocal staves. I'm going to delete that little bracket there because that's not appropriate here. Um, so I've got Q. I'm going to have A, Q, Fen, Fall, and then others. So let me just do that right now. And I'm going to uh, double click this vocal so I can change the name here to A. <laughs> I don't know who A is, but that's what it is for now. And I'm going to go ahead and name the other ones while I'm at it. So I'll hit apply, then the down arrow. And now this guy is Q. Q. And apply, and then down arrow, Fen. Fen. And then you, you have to hit apply. It's a mandatory thing. Otherwise, it doesn't take. The next one is, I'm going to guess that fall is Falstaff. So I'm going to enter Falstaff as the long name. So the long name, if you don't know, that's what shows up on the first time that staff is used. So on the, on the first system, you will get Falstaff. And then on subsequent systems, you get the abbreviated name. So fall. And uh, that's all I need for here. So um, so why don't I have a, a look at the uh, first page? Because if I do that, it's going to take me too long to find this page again, frankly. If someone else wants to do that for me, uh, have a ball. You can. Someone else wants to look that up and tell me. But yeah, in real life, I would have figured that out already and kind of set things up because I wouldn't have often... Um, uh, I wouldn't have often just entered page 429 of a, of a score. Okay, and there's also a question in here about 1, 3, 2, and 4. Um, so the thing is, this isn't about voices. So it, it's a thing that in Muse score, voices 1 and 3 stems up, voices 2 and 4 stems down. And it feels like, hey, this is related, but it's, it's kind of not. Because with horns, it's literally two staves horn one and horn three on the top. Oh, wait a minute. Do I have that right? Am I getting, is it that? Horn... <sighs> yes, horns, I, 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 I really have to think about this. Horns one and horns three are on the top staff. Horns two and horns four are on the bottom staff. And very often horns one and horns three are sharing the same part. Horns two and four are sharing the same part. So we only need one voice per staff but there will be sometimes when horns one and three split into two parts and then you then you do the actual separate voices so here's what what what's happening in an orchestra with only two horn parts they're going to be horns one and two and we're going to put them on separate staves um but if you're going to have four horn players you're going to double them up and so you're going to add a second horn player to double up on the first part and you're going to add a, a, a fourth so if you've, you've already got horn one, horn two, separate parts. If you're going to double up these things to make the horns louder, you're going to double up on the first part and you're going to double up on the second part. But then we already called them horns one and two. So instead we call the guy doubling one, three, and we call the guy doubling four, two, four. And then what happens is horn players specialize. Some people specialize in being horn one or three. They specialize in playing high notes. Other people specialize in playing low notes. And you actually, you know, set up your horn, practice your embouchure, get the right mouthpiece to specialize that way. So there's kind of this whole historical thing going on with horns. That's And then aside from that, there's the whole question of transpositions and all the different specialties for that. So yeah, horns have a, a fascinating sort of history as far as how they get, how they work. And then the fact that traditionally horn parts are, are notated without a key signature, regardless of the key. That's another unique thing about horns. Um, so uh, 
Um, I've ne I have not seen trumpets one and three, two and four done that, but I don't see orchestral scores that have four trumpets. Most orchestral scores just have at most three. Um, and in a jazz setting, you would never do that. Horns one, uh, trumpets one, two, three, four are just separate staves in that order. But uh, yeah, I could totally imagine that if you were going to have four trumpets, you would, and you would put them on two staves and one and three, two and four for the exact same reason. Usually it's only two trumpets on two staves, but then if you want to double them up, you make it one and three, two and four. And then if you need to, to have the one and three play different notes, you can do that with separate staves. And just as with horn players, there are high note specialists for trumpet and low note specialists for trump. There's not such thing as a low note trumpet specialist on trumpet. Everyone can play in low notes. But for a horn, it actually is a thing. But for high note specialist really is a thing, especially as you move into jazz, because there's people who can play crazy, crazy high notes. And I had a dream about that for some reason last night. For some reason, I had a dream about playing a recording with some crazy high notes on the trumpet. Um, any case, I've got my 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 uh, staves set up now here. I got my guys all notated. And so now on the cue staff, I can come into that third measure, quarter rest, and it's a triplet of three eighth notes. So five, and then control three, and then it's uh, this treble clef, C, C, C. Now, here's the thing where if I had had a shortcut all set up to break those beams, I would uh, maybe have hit it right away after entering those notes, but I don't. But that's okay. Instead, I am actually going to use a plugin to automatically beam this for me. I'll show you that in a minute. So uh, I got my dot, dot, dum, and then my uh, D down here, and then G up there. Um, and those are both accented. So I'm going to, oh, I guess I'm still in node input mode. So shift V. When I hit shift left, I was trying to select the two, but it actually exchanged them because that's what happens when you're in node input mode. Um, so shift V to put an accent on this guy. Now here, I am going to take his advice of putting the accent marks above the staff. Why? Because lyrics. So the accents are going to go above, and so is that three. Now, it, it would be nice. There are style settings where I can force the accent marks above for the whole score, but there's not a way to say, hey, do vocal staves one way, instrumental staves another way. Someday, we'd love to have a feature like that. It's not there right now. So can you add a different instrument and change back mid-staff? Yeah, well, yes, you can by adding instrument changes from the, uh, from the text palette. But uh, yeah, every yeah. If you change back, you got to add another one, and it's a new channel. If you want to change back to the second instrument again, you add another change instrument. It's going to pile up the channels. Right now, there is no way to do that unless your instrument is already set up. Like violin is already set up with multiple channels for pizzicato versus arco. So you could set up a custom instrument that's set up with all the different sounds that you're going to want, and then use staff text rather than instrument changes to change between them but that won't give you that won't give you the uh um like the transposit the ability to change transpositions uh when the instrument changes so and setting up custom instruments is a sort of very advanced complex thing that's not really documented but possible anyhow um okay ah good alice nanetta thank you meg quickly uh, thank you for the uh, thank you for the names there. All right, so uh, I've got those uh, notes in there, and I'm going to go ahead and um, put in the lyrics while I'm at it. And right off the bat, I know enough Italian to tell me that "tut tu" is probably one word, right? It's probably "tutto." Um, no. Um, boy, I, 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 you know, it's like I know. Yeah, because here's that same word in Falstaff's part. It's it's one word. So it's T-U-T hyphen T-O. Now here, for reasons of saving a little space that was a little too close together, the editor maybe left out the hyphen. I'm going to let MuseScore deal that for me. So I'm, I'm going to enter it hyphenated. And if I later on need to change something, I will. But I'm going to enter it the way it really should be, which is hyphenated. Tuto nel mon do, oops, what the, oh no, no, no. Okay, so you get to learn something new. Or, so this is mondo 
on one quarter note. So mon, and then I need to hit control hyphen to get the uh, hyphen to be part of that same syllable. Ha, huh. mondo. Now I type a real. No, not a not a hyphen at all, but a space. So this is e, um, which is e with the back uh, tick accent. So the thing is, I do have a keyboard capable of doing that, but not while I'm in Linux mode. Uh, I think. Let me let, actually let me test that theory because I don't actually remember this now. So control this and then tick e. Yeah, that doesn't do it. It only works while I'm in uh, in. Uh, not Linux mode. So I'm going to instead use the special characters palette, which is F2 to display that, and then just click the lowercase e with that back accent. Now, the thing is, I think I might have accidentally entered some kind of garbage character in there. So I'm going to just do that one more time. I think when I was hitting the shortcut to change keyboards, it probably entered some weird control character. Um, so the thing is, I'm going to need that E a bunch of times. I know that. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and add it to a palette. Um, so the question, I think I need to close this palette, leave here, and I'm going to open my palettes window. And I'm going to go to my, I guess, text palette. See, I'm in a special workspace that I've created here, my cafe workspace that I can just play with. I'll go to my text palette, and I'm just going to reopen that. Um, uh, special characters dialog. You have to be in text edit mode and then just drag in the E. There it is. And now I can easily enter that E. Chances are I'm going to need some of these other things also, but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. So I've got that lyric in there. Um, so, uh, I see a question about um, two instruments on same stem. So, okay, so, um, yeah, it, it's pretty common. If you're talking about, like, the oboe part here, it's actually pretty common um, to still notate both oboes on the same staff and, where possible, to combine their stems. It's just that this clarinet part, to only switch to two stems for one note within a measure to me is a little wonky. I would do it. I would make that choice a phrase at a time or a measure at a time. I think I, I don't know. I would have to consult some other scores and some other sources, but alarm bells are ringing off for me that this just looks weird to me. Um, but maybe it's not, I don't know. I'd have to study some more scores. Certainly a lot of scores also would put the clarinets on separate staves simply because a lot of notation software doesn't make it easy to get generate second, separate parts from one staff, um, including MuseScore. It's possible, but with, with workarounds and weirdness. Oh, and that's the other thing. If I want to create um, separate parts from this, I'm not going to be able to do it the way I have it. So uh, I would actually, you know, I would have to have these two notes for the oboe in separate voices in order to uh, be able to generate parts um, for that. And then it won't look like the original anymore. And then I'd have to decide, well, is that okay? Or do I use one invisible staff to look like the original to show in the score? And then two other staves, no, that stave would be visible, but I wouldn't generate parts for it. And then two other staves or one other staff, I should say one other staff in which I do combine the parts onto one staff um uh on, on yeah onto one uh one onto one stem and generate generate parts from the ones with two two voices and but make that staff invisible it, it's it's complicated for me to explain it's complicated to do but it's possible um if it were me doing this i think i literally would enter this into separate voices so i'm going to actually just do that i'm going to use uh control two to move that to voice two or control alt two, that's the shortcut for set for voice two. And I'm just gonna move these things into separate voices because what the heck, I can. Um, Sorry, now, could you say that again? Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. For some reason, Siri is convinced that I'm talking to her. I assure her I'm not. And I feel like those invisible rests that I created, I wanna select now that invisible rest. 
So I'm going to, when I select this rest, notice it's voice one, but I know there's an invisible rest hiding behind it. So I'm going to now control click it. That now selects the invisible rest behind it. And I can press V to make it visible again. Um, and the same. So here, this rest here, I, I'm going to now use the arrow keys and navigate to that invisible rest, make it visible. Navigate here, make it visible. Now I ask myself, do I need all those invisible rests? No, I guess I really don't. So I'm going to make them all invisible again. I'm changing my mind here. So I think this is how I would actually choose to notate that. And I'm just going to make these rests invisible too then. There we go. So um, yeah, I, I think this feels like how I would choose to do that. And then I'll make these rests invisible. I, even though you can delete rests in voice two, I don't like to, it leaves a hard to edit hole. And I'm really afraid of what will happen if I try to generate parts from a, a voice that's got holes in it. So, um, yeah, a new palette with stuff that you need just for the one score. Ah, yeah, that's a great idea. I, I seldom enough need to do that specifically. But if I was doing something like this where I, I ha I'm doing Italian and the word a eh is a common word in Italian, um, then I would totally have an uh, Italian palette that just had Italian letters and phrase because the thing is then there's other things that i'm uh, if it's a spanish one i'm going to need an enye right if it's german i'm going to need a u umlaut so um i'm going to need different special characters for different languages so i could totally have an italian palette a spanish palette and a french palette etc or i could just have a foreign palette but that starts to look too much like like just the special characters palette like this big uh collection of too much stuff so um in any case, uh, I'm talking, you know, as much as I'm entering, which is pretty normal when I'm doing these things. But let me enter a little bit more music, and then I'm going to show you that plugin. So, uh, Fen Fentanyl, <laughs> whatever his name is, um, is it Mondo? Uh, so I, I guess I'm not understanding the Mondo A thing. Um, the underscore you have. Uh, elision. Because isn't this two separate words, mondo? Eh? Those are two separate words, as far as I know. Um, yeah, as far as I know, th those are two separate words. Um, mondo is like whole or world or something like that. Uh, yeah, I should know this stuff, but I don't. Um, okay, uh, so I'm looking at this bracket thing that I see in uh whoever this person is here fen alice fen fenton um i i see this bracket here that i'm not really understanding what that bracket is meant to convey i'm going to make it a little bigger i still don't understand it so i'm going to leave it alone because i have no idea what it what it is and so i'm just not going to worry about it right now uh, so I'm going to enter that part there. It's, um, let me uh, scroll this thing down a little bit. It's eighth note, B, staccato, G, staccato, and then dotted half, E, up here, tied, uh, tied to a triplet. So unfortunately, that's a weird thing we have to like enter the triplet separately, then tie it. We don't have a way to easily tie into a triplet the way we can tie into other note values. So five, control three to create the talent, to create the triplet, enter my E. And then I guess while I'm at it, I'll enter the other E. And now I see that I've got a whole bunch of triplets. So I'm actually going to enter one triplet. And then I'm going to select it and go R, R. And that's going to give me more triplets. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a, a nice trick for setting up triplets. Now I can come back here, enter my tie, and uh, enter my notes here now. F, boom, 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 and then G down here. And that time I knew it was going to enter a regular eighth note G, not a triplet, and that's what I wanted. And then uh, a 16th C, and then a 16th rest, and then a double dotted 
uh, C. So I get to use the double dot on the palette and then C. Ah, but look at that. I forgot to change the quarter note. So undo that. Type five, double dot, and now my C. And then the rest of that measure is a 16th note C, and then a five, control three, B, G, B. And those are all staccato. So select those, mark them staccato. Oops, I typed, I typed S, not shift S, so shift S. And um, good, now that double dotted note has an accent on it, get that. And I'm being very haphazard here about the order that I do things in. Again, typically I'm uh, a little more organized, but I think trying to talk while doing it is making me less organized than I otherwise might be. Um, but and at least that's the excuse I'm going to give you here. Uh, so now I'm going to put in those. Actually, I'm going to select. Here's the other thing I'm going to do. I'm going to select all the staccato dots on this staff. So I'm going to right click that staccato dot, select all similar in same staff. And then I am going to open the inspector. And I'm going to set the staccato dots to above. Wait a minute, that didn't do it? No, it's not direction. It's, huh. You know, to be honest, I thought that was gonna work. Uh, that's unfortunate because I really wanna set them all above. Huh. Well, let me try something else. I'm gonna select this one and just press X and see what changed in the inspector, nothing. Okay, above chord is what changed. So that's what I need. So, okay, learn something there. Select all similar elements and same staff and set them all to above chord. There we go. So normally I would wait till I was all done with the entire score and then set all of the vocal. I would select all the vocal staves and do that at once. But I wanted to show you how I can move all the staccato dots up above together. Uh, so I would normally wait until kind of towards the end to mess with that. So um, uh, could be a tenor clef. Oh, yeah, you're right. That could be a tenor clef, huh? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so that's telling me. Is this telling me that literally this second to top line is the C is middle C? like a tenor clef, like a regular tenor clef, as opposed to the vocal tenor clef, where it's it's kind of the, the second to top space that's middle C. I think you're right. I think it's a, I think this is tenor clef, because it makes no sense. If this is a dude, it makes no sense that he's singing way up here, right? So I'm going to take these notes, and I'm going to move them down an octave, because they are down an octave, and I'm just going to go ahead and change that to tenor clef. Um, and I'm going to assume, well, Falstaff is in bass clef. So I'm gonna change Falstaff to bass clef. And change Fenton to tenor clef. Now the question is, do we have under more that special clef? I've never seen it before. So no, it's not exactly that. It's, you know, that this is this French tenor clef there, but that's not the one. Um, if I if I go to the the uh, master palette. Clefts. Is there any other special? There's nothing else there either. So no, that's um. We're just he's just I'm just gonna be that tenor clef. But so so those notes that I entered um were not even the right pitches. Is that true? So I thought that this was a B, but according to this, it's an A. So I'm actually off by a step. So I'm off by a step in my note entry. Um, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to use the diatonic pitch down command. Normally it's shift alt down arrow, but on my keyboard, I've got it customized to shift alt left bracket diatonic down a step. So now that's an A. 
And notice that the staff is displaying in red because it thinks that this is a soprano, which it's not. It's uh, whatever Fenton is, a, a tenor. So yeah, I should change. I, I should actually change instrument. I should go back to staff part properties and, you know, fiddle all of this. It's not really a soprano. It's really a tenor. So I should go into my vo vocals here and change to tenor. When I do that, it's going to change the clef on me also. I don't want to do that. I'm just going to change it to voice. But I will say Fenton, and I will say F-E-N, period. So that keeps the, the clef that I had. There we go. And now it doesn't think that those notes are too low for my soprano. Um, so what else do I need to do? I need to do the same thing I did with that bracket. So again, it looks like this guy, as a matter of course, doesn't use brackets on his triplets when they encumber, uh, when they encompass rests. Um, so, you know, it's possible I could make that into like a style setting. Um, I could say bracket type none as a style setting. And then I can override it where necessary. I think I'm going to do that. So I'll hit that set as style button. And I will also select. See, the thing is the bra the threes above the staff for triplets. I feel like that might only be for vocal stays where he wants to do that. So I'm going to use that same trick of selecting all similar same staff and setting the direction to up. And that moves it all move them above. It's either usually direction or placement, but for articulations, it was the anchor. In any case, X moves the X moves them individually, but you can use the inspector to force them all kind of up. So uh, that's all well and good. Um, I want to quickly enter those uh, lyrics so that I can show you uh, the cool pr uh um, plug in, and then I'll call it a day. Burla period. What is this guy speaking French? No, this is this just looked like French, but it's not. L U O M, and then, uh, and then here's my E again. So come back to my text palette, and there's my E. And then, na to so ne ne, and I could see I I, left, I forgot a hyphen. For because Berlone, I, I didn't, I, 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 I was wondering about that word because it wasn't making sense to me. Berlone, and then to to, and now here's the thing that you're talking about, uh, Mirabilis, uh, to an A sharing a syllable. That's a lesion, right? So I'm going to use the, uh, and did I put that on my palette? I feel like maybe, I feel like I had added that to my palette at some point, uh, but maybe only my own palette. Yeah, because it's not here. But if I go to the special characters palette, there's the elision symbols here, right? So I can enter the little bracket underneath. And then my A. So that's what should have been there. You don't see it here, but modern uh, editors would put that uh, little elision um, symbol there. And then here it's burr hyphenated. Oops. There it's burr hyphenated and we don't get to see where it goes to uh so i left out a hyphen after a low here let me get that okay so um that's fenton's part let me add the dynamics and then i'm going to do the cool well actually i'm going to wait till do the dynamics until after i do the cool plug-in thing because i'm afraid the that it might mess it up so what i'm going to do is i'm going to select well, I'm going to save first. Now I'm going to select all, Control A. Now I'm going to come to my plugins palette and say traditional vocal beaming. 
Notice what it did. It broke all of those beams in places where there were not melismas. So all the places where it's one syllable for note, they all got their beams broken. But this last burr uh, got kept. Oh, I, I guess I didn't get the pitches right. That's a C. Oh, I know why, because I, I typed, I, I remember typing a B in for some reason. Uh, cool, because I thought I was typing burr. So this is supposed to be a B, B, hello. Oh, that is a B. Silly me, this is an A. I, I just don't read Tanner Clef, right? An A, and then that must be an F. There we go. Um, so here he's got his staccato dots underneath. So I was totally wasting my time putting them above the staff, but so be it. Um, let me re-enter them. Select that one, reset it. Okay, so uh, yeah, I don't like those staccato dots above the staff, but for that G there, but I guess that's correct because that happened here or, or I did it myself. Anyhow, that vocal, that traditional vocal beaming plugin is really nice for stuff like this. Um, and then you'll notice, of course, the instrumental parts uh, are, there's no lyrics, to, so the beams don't get broken there. Now there's a couple other things that are quirky here. So yeah, now I could enter my dynamics and enter uh, uh, the dynamics. There is an F, a forte, and it's, above the staff, so X. And again, because the vocal staves, we're gonna want them all above the staff, but the instrumental staves, we're not. Um, so I'm just gonna end up just doing these one at a time. I can't make it a style setting or it would apply to all of them. Now, this edition is doing something that was common 100 years ago or 100, 200 years ago is less common now, and I'm not gonna do it because it's confusing. It's using a, what looks like a slur instead of a triplet bracket. So that's, uh, it's really a, a weird and odd choice, and it's just confusing because it makes it look like these are melismas, or it makes it look like they're slurs, and it's not. It's just a, a triplet bracket that's round. And then why did he make this one be a triplet bracket, but not the ones that should have been like the ones with the rest. So it's, it's, um, unfortunately he's being inconsistent about this and I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to copy what that editor did there. So, um, so I've missed a certain amount of comments, um, here. Uh, so my reason for wanting to use the actual tenor clef here now will be so that my notation matches this. And then when I'm done, I might change this to the modern tenor clef, which is just the, uh, you know, uh, not modern tenor clef, modern tenor voice clef. It's the treble clef, 8VA bassa, this clef here. So now this is more clearly A, F, D and not B, G, E like I thought it was. Um, this is the clef that modern tenors read, but uh, the tenor clef that's used by, you know, uh, mm, bassoons when they get too high, et cetera, is um, uh, not one that many singers today would ever read. So, um, but then the, I guess one question is, you know, it would also, I, I really think the fact that that bracket appears to be centering on that on that second to top line suggests that that's really the, the, uh, the right thing. But here's the other thing, though. Look at the chord here. You know what? Oh, man. So this is like crazy. And I don't know if, if, if you've, you've all noticed it and you've already commented it and you're laughing at me now. Um, but I think... Um, I think that, um, yeah, this printing is severely misaligned. So yeah, I, okay. So here's the thing. Uh, I think this really is our tenor clef because check this out. Um, check this out. The uh, chord here is basically a C chord. Look at the oboes, C and G. Look at the clarinets, E and C. That's a C chord. This is a C major triad sounding at that point. Um, Fenton is singing a G going to a C, Falstaff, or I'm not, I'm sorry, I don't know about Fenton yet, because that's one I'm, that, the que that has a question mark in my mind, Falstaff is on a C, um, to me, it makes no sense that, uh, 
these two notes here in Fenton's part would be F to B when there's clearly a C chord happening here. I think that really is a G and a C just like it looks. I think that that's the case. So I think, Mirabilis, you're absolutely right that that is a printing error <laughs> and nothing more. So I'm going to go ahead and move those back diatonically up a step. And I'm going to change that clef back to the one I want it to be, which is our tenor clef. So I think this is right. And I think if I play this now, it's going to sound good. Yeah, that sounds fine. Um, so I think that that's correct. So, um, Yeah, so unfortunately, I'm focusing on what I'm doing here, and I miss comments in the chat. But yeah, you, you pointed out the printing error, and so yeah, I, I'm glad that you pointed that out. And then the, the, the clincher for me is looking at the actual pitches in there. So I'm going to wrap up here because it's taken you know uh, a long time to enter this much. The thing is, when I enter this music for real, when I'm not talking my way through it, and I have my second monitor for the PDF, or I'm working on a piece of paper, I could have done that whole page in 20 minutes probably. But you know, I want to talk through so that you all know what it is that I'm doing. Um, you know, now that I look at these threes without the slurs, I feel like they need the brackets because without the without the beam connecting them they want the brackets. So I'm actually going to go back and I'm going to put the brackets back on. I'm just going to say bracket type bracket is going to be my style setting. Um, and then if there's certain places where I, you know, want to hide the bracket, I can, uh, auto, I just want auto bracket type auto because auto does normally intelligent things like leave it out if the notes are beamed, but include it when the notes are not beamed. That's the norm. So I'm going to just use that setting and then override it when I think I need to, but I doubt I very often need to. All right. So, um, so there you go. Uh, hope you found this session useful. It's kind of interesting. All the different things that come up can be different things than I originally think are going to come up, but they're all interesting things, right? So I'm going to talk loud for a second while I turn the volume down on the music. There we go. Um, so thanks everyone for hanging with me and watching this demonstration of looking at really a whole lot of different things because it's an opera score and that involves lyrics and other vocal things, but it also involves instrumental music, it involves multiple parts, it involves lots of things that we got to look at there. And I never even generated parts from the score, I just made some of the choices that I made in anticipation of maybe wanting to generate parts from that score and having separate voices uh, rather than ever combining things onto one chord simplifies that in Muse score. And it doesn't, it, it, it's, no one's going to bat an eye at that as a conductor saying, oh, you should have combined those onto one stem. They're going to, they're, they're going to be fine with it. So um, anyhow, this, this is like a regular series I'm doing. So I would love it if people would drop some comments in here, go to the community, drop some comments there about, uh, you know, any other suggestions of scores you'd like to see me enter. And uh, by all means, come back next week, come back tomorrow for the music masterclass in which we'll be uh, looking at the kind of wrapping up of the jazz piano holiday course we've got some great uh arrangements that people are finishing up here and so i'm excited to be uh showing off some of those and uh uh next week next week is uh, i will be on vacation and so i think next week i won't be doing cafe or, or master class normally but i will probably do a special event to wrap up that uh um a jazz piano course so stay tuned for information about that so anyhow thanks everyone for being here and i'll catch you all next time <laughs>